long divide each of the following. In this first example, we have a cubic dividend, 8x cubed minus 7x squared minus 10x plus 9, and we're going to divide that by the divisor, 8x plus 9. 8x plus 9 will go outside the division bracket. Your dividend goes underneath. To get the process started, and all the busy work will be to your right side of the screen, you go through several cycles of the same steps. So let's get this going. Uh, you take your first term from underneath, divide it by the first term of your divisor. 8x cubed divided by 8x is x squared. That result goes up top. This will end up being your quotient. Then you take your result, x squared, times the divisor. Over to the right, 8x plus 9 times x squared is 8x cubed plus 9x squared. This result you put underneath. So after you divide, that result goes on top. After you multiply, that result goes underneath. Because we're subtracting, you change the sign of both terms. Vertically, you will have like terms. If the first column adds up to zero, you're in good shape. You're doing it right. The second column, negative 7x squared minus 9x squared is negative 16x squared. And that is one cycle. We'll bring our next term down and start the process over. Now I'm going to switch to blue ink. First term underneath negative 16x squared divided by first term outside, that's 8x over to your right. That division gives you negative 2x. This result you put up top in the quotient. Then negative 2x times the divisor. That gives us negative 16x squared minus 18x. After multiplying, that result goes underneath. Change your signs. Subtracting a negative is the same as adding so we'll change both signs. Vertically, you have like terms. That adds up to zero. That's good news. The second column, when you add, you get 8x. Bring your last term down, and you start the process all over. Now I'm switching to green ink. First term under 8x divided by first term outside. 8x over 8x is 1. And this will be the final term of the quotient. 1 times the divisor is 8x plus 9. That goes underneath. Change your signs. If the term's positive, make it negative, and vice versa. Vertically combine like terms. The first column does go to zero. The second column also goes to zero. Since the remainder is zero, our answer is this quotient, x squared minus 2x plus 1. In our second example, we have a dividend of x cubed plus 4x squared minus 3x minus 13 and a divisor of x minus 3. We're going to go through the same process starting with pink. We're going to go first term underneath divided by first term outside. x cubed over x is x squared. x squared goes up in your quotient. x squared times the divisor is 8x cubed minus 3x squared. That'll go underneath. Change your signs and then vertically add like terms. The first column goes to zero. The second column makes 7x squared. Bring your next term down and then you start the process over. And I'm going to switch to the blue ink to do that. 7x squared divided by x is 7x. That goes in the quotient. 7x times the divisor is 7x squared minus 21x. Write that underneath. Change your signs. This term's positive. You change it to negative. This term's negative. Change it to positive. First column adds up to zero. That's good news. Second column adds up to 18x minus 13 when you drag your last term down. And then we'll switch to green ink and go through the last cycle. 18x divided by 1x is 18. 18 goes up in the quotient. 18 times the divisor is 18x minus 54. Change your signs. 18x minus 18x is 0. Good. Negative 13 plus 54 is 41. If you have a remainder that's not 0, then when you write your full answer, it's quotient 
plus or minus, depending on the sign of your remainder, this one's a positive 41, over your divisor. So if you have a remainder that's not zero, then you have a fraction out here on the end. Remainder over divisor. Consider the function 4x plus 8 over x plus 4. In factored form, the numerator can be also be written as 4 times x plus 2. Um, what it does, it makes it easier to find your intercepts. All right, first, let's discuss domain. Domain is the set of all x values for which your function is defined. Since that's too many to list, what we do is we figure out what makes this function undefined, a zero denominator, and whatever value of x creates that issue, we throw away. The value of x that makes this denominator zero is a negative four. So your domain is actually all real numbers such that you don't use negative four. The x-intercept comes from setting your numerator equal to zero. So you can either take the original numerator or the factor down um, 4x plus 8 or x plus 2. That comes to 0 when x is negative 2. And that gives you the ordered pair negative 2, 0. x is negative 2 when your function is equal to 0. The y-intercept can be found by substituting 0 into your x's. X is equal to zero on the y-axis, so that's how you find a y-intercept. Substituting in zero leaves you with eight over four, which is two, and that gives you the point zero, two. Plug a zero in, two is your answer. Vertical asymptote. When you look at the factored form of your function, if the denominator cannot be canceled with anything from the numerator, then the number you threw out of your domain makes up what's called a vertical asymptote. It's a vertical column of dead space that your graph doesn't exist. For horizontal asymptote, you check out your dominant terms from the numerator and denominator. If those dominant terms have the same exponent, then your horizontal asymptote will be the coefficients of those dominant terms. Well, since 4x and 1x have the same exponent, the unwritten 1, your horizontal asymptote will be those coefficients of 4 and the unwritten 1. So that comes out to 4. Let's check out the graph. Now in class, I encourage you to use your graphing calculators if you've got them. Um, I don't want you to become dependent on them because throughout your calculus sequence, you may or may not get to use them. Uh, if you have me for calculus, we definitely use them. Okay, so a vertical asymptote of negative 4 means that there's going to be a column of dead space where your graph doesn't exist on um, this vertical line x equals negative 4. Our horizontal asymptote is the horizontal line y equals 4. Now, vertical asymptote identifies a location where your function is not defined. So you won't have any graph that exists on a vertical asymptote. What a horizontal asymptote signifies is with a rational function that as you let your x values get really large or really small, your function will start settling down on a particular value. For this function, it is the y value of 4. Our x-intercept we discovered to be negative 2, 0. Our y-intercept happened to be the point zero, 02, and that gives us some ammo that we need to do the graph. Most of the time at a vertical asymptote, your graph will swoop up or down on either side. There are cases where you get a couple of upward swings or a couple of downward swings. Uh, anytime you need to learn more about the graph and you don't have a graphing calculator, just randomly plug in some x values. Like over here in class, I took a negative eight, subbed it into the function, and we got five for the answer, excuse me, six for the answer. And so we know if we plug in a negative eight and our answer is six, that negative eight six is a point on the graph. Same thing here, just randomly pick an x value like negative six, sub it into your original function, 
the answer happens to be 8, so we know that negative 6, 8 is another point on the graph. For this next rational function, we have 4x plus 20 over x squared plus x minus 20. If we factor the numerator, we get 4 times x plus 5. Our denominator is factorable as x plus 5, x minus 4. This x plus 5 factor can be removed by canceling, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in a little bit. x minus 4 is a factor that does not cancel. So if you were to cancel common factors, you would be left with 4 over x minus 4. Your domain, again, is all the good values of x, so it's easier to identify the bad ones. This factor is 0 when x equals negative 5. This factor is 0 when x equals 4. So your domain is all real numbers such that x is not negative 5 or 4. And this was the factoring breakdown. The x-intercept, because our fraction reduces to a numerator without a variable, there's no way to make the numerator zero, so there's no x-intercept. Our y-intercept, we plug zero into the x's, and that gives us four over negative four. You can either do it in the reduced or the original. If you plug zeros into the original, you get 20 over negative 20, and that's negative one. If you do it in the reduced, it's four over negative four, which is also negative one. Y-intercepts are unique. Plug a zero in, your answer is negative one, that's your y-intercept. Vertical asymptote, here we go. That comes from the factor that you cannot cancel. X minus four still remains after canceling. X minus four is zero when X equals four. So that's your vertical asymptote. The horizontal asymptote, for this one, you look at your dominant terms, four X to the first over X squared. Now, since a horizontal asymptote is the behavior of a function when x is really large or really small, if your bottom term is more dominant than the top term, it will go to zero every time. Why is that? A really large number squared is way larger than a really large number times four. The larger x gets, the faster that denominator grows, and the faster a denominator grows, the smaller your fraction gets overall. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, which is also your x-axis. That's true any time your denominator is more dominant than the numerator. Let's discuss this x plus five. This x plus five is part of the original problem, but we can cancel it out or remove it. In calculus, this will be called a removable discontinuity or a hole in the graph. I call it a hole in the graph. That factor that gets canceled out was x plus 5. If you set that equal to 0, you get negative 5. Plugging negative 5 into the original or reduced function, it was 4 over x minus 4 in the reduced form, if we sub that in, we get the value negative 4 ninths. Pairing up negative 5 and negative 4 ninths identifies where the hole in the graph occurs. So let me shrink this down. If you want to pause this video, um, you can write this information down or screenshot it, however you want to do it. I ran out of room in class, so the next slide will be the graph to this function. After factoring and reducing, 4 over x minus 4 is what the graph will look like, but there will be a hole in it at this point at the bottom of your screen. So let me switch to the next slide, and you'll see the graph. We discovered a vertical asymptote at the factor that remained. It was x minus 4. x minus 4 is 0 when x equals positive 4. So vertical asymptote is a column of dead space where your graph doesn't exist. Because the denominator had a more dominant term than the numerator, our horizontal asymptote was the x-axis, or y equals zero. We've discovered a hole in the graph 
the factor that did cancel was x plus 5. We had one on top and bottom and we canceled them. That factor, when set equal to 0, gives you negative 5. Negative 5 substituted into the original function or the reduced one either way will give you an answer of negative 4 ninths. So input, output, that makes a point on the graph. But since this is a hole in the graph, you leave it open. It's like a pixel gets left out of it, out of the graph. Uh, randomly in class, oh, also before I forget, we didn't have an x-intercept, so there's no points on the x-axis to mark. We did have a y-intercept at 0, negative 1, and in class we just randomly picked a few more x's. I picked 5 and 6, plugged them into the original function or the reduced one, and your answers were 4 and 2 respectively. So we have two more points that helps us with the behavior of this graph. A hole comes from a factor you can cancel. A vertical asymptote comes from a factor you cannot cancel. Last function for this video, we have the rational function x squared minus x plus 7 over x minus 7. Our domain that is made up of all real numbers such that the denominator is not 0. When is our denominator 0? When x is 7. So we can't use that number, but all other numbers are good. This numerator has variables. In fact, it's a quadratic numerator, but it's never equal to zero with real numbers. One of the things we discovered in previous lessons was a discriminant. If you take b squared minus 4ac, you get a negative value. b squared would be negative 1 squared, that's 1, minus 4 times 1 times 7, that's 1 minus 28. That's a negative value. If your discriminant is negative, you have no real solutions. And if that's the case, we don't have any x-intercepts. The y-intercept plugs zeros in for x. We end up with 7 over negative 7, which is negative 1. So that's the point 0, negative 1. There are no horizontal asymptotes, or there is no horizontal asymptote, because the numerator power or degree of the numerator is one larger than the degree of the denominator. So we have x squared over x as our um, dominant terms. If the numerator is larger than the denominator by one, you have what's called an oblique or a slant asymptote. To find a slant asymptote, you divide your denominator into your numerator. So in the highlighted portion, we took x minus 7, divided it into our numerator, the dividend of x squared minus x plus 7. Through our long division process, we've got a quotient of x plus 6. Now, even though there's a remainder with slant asymptote, all you need is the quotient. It turns out that this graph will have a slant asymptote along the line, and here in green, we sketch the line x plus 6. x plus 6 crosses the y-axis at 6 and has a slope of 1. So this green dashed line represents our slant asymptote. The vertical asymptote, because our original denominator could not be canceled with anything in the numerator, x minus 7 equals 0 when x is 7, that produces a vertical asymptote. Let me zoom out a little bit. When you assemble all this information, we had a y-intercept of 0, negative 1, a slant asymptote of the line x plus 6, a vertical asymptote of x equals 7, no x-intercept, so we don't hit the x-axis at all. Um, we also used a graphing calculator just to get a quick idea of the graph. Uh, if you don't have that, you just pick extra values of x, sub them into your original problem, and just pair up the number you plug in and the answer you get. 
Long story short, here's our graph. We have the diversion at the vertical asymptote, and we have a, it doesn't flatten out, it slants out along this green dashed slant or oblique asymptote. 